All right, let's uh, go ahead and get started. Uh, I'll pray for us. Father, I pray that as we interact with this text that uh, you'll help us see it in a more real way and that you'll cause us to be grateful for what you've done for us. Uh, help us today. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. So we're going to look at a couple of stories, a couple of narratives from the Gospels. And we're looking at today Jesus and the Gathering Demoniac. And this story appears in Mark 5, 1 to 20, Matthew 8, 28, and Luke 8, 26. And one of the things you always want to do when you look at gospel story is you want to read the parallels. Uh, a lot of times the parallels will give you an insight into the fullest picture. And you also want to ask what goes before it and what goes after it. So you're just learning how to read in context, and that's what we want to do today. So we're going to read this story, but before we do it, we want to read the story that happens before this story. And the event that happens before is Jesus stilling of the storm. So I'm going to read this in all three accounts. Uh, if you don't uh, mind, I'm just going to do a literal translation from the Greek, and we'll read through it. This is Matthew's version. Matthew 8, uh, 23. And Jesus, seeing the crowd around him, uh, commanded that they sail across the lake. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, a great earthquake came about on the sea so that the ship was covered up by the waves, but he was sleeping. And uh, when they came to him, they got him up saying, Lord, save us, we're perishing. And he said to them, why are you such cowards? Oh, you of little faith. Then having gotten up, he rebuked the wind and the wave, and there came about a great calm. Now, if we read that same story in Mark and Luke, they would add the detail that Jesus, that this was happening during a hurricane force wind. Now, the Sea of Galilee is below sea level. I don't know if you knew that, but it's kind of in a bowl. Um, it's about eight miles across, about 13 miles long. Uh, the wind will rush down and swirl. And so you can imagine uh, a hurricane force wind. And the text says that Jesus rebuked the wind. And in all three of the counts, it ends with the question, who is this that the wind and sea obey him? Now, do you have a, a Bible with you today, or do you have access to a phone? All right. Is there a cross-reference to any of those verses in particular? Who is this that the wind and sea obey him? Any cross-references? It's a, a great thing to read through as we're reading through. Uh, no verses, no anything, just reading the text. Uh, sometimes when you come to a particular uh, portion and you ask, uh, is this referencing anything in the Old Testament? Sometimes that's helpful as well. Are there any parallel passages that you see in terms of cross-references?
when I did this, I got three. And they're from the Old Testament. And anytime I'm reading and there's an Old Testament parallel, that's going to make the bells go off. Jonathan? And what does Psalm 107 say? It says, um, Some went down to the sea in ships, doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous work in the deep. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to the heaven, to heaven. They went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men, and were at their wit's end. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. And who is the one doing that? Yahweh. So when the disciples asked the question, who is this that the wind and sea obey them? If they had been reading the Old Testament, the Old Testament says whom the wind and sea, who it is that the wind and sea obey, and who is it? It's God. And that's uh, Psalm uh, uh, 25. He made the storm be still. That's Yahweh doing it. Yahweh makes the storm be still. Jesus makes the storm be still. Uh, if we looked at other parallels, we would see uh, Psalm 65, 7, speaking of God who stills the roaring of the seas and the roaring of their waves. Uh, God again in Psalm 89, uh, verse 9, you rule the raging of the sea when its waves rise, you Stilled it. So when the disciples see Jesus sleeping, and then Jesus stills the storm, and they say, Who is this that the wind and sea? Go? They may not realize it yet, but the Old Testament is telling them who Jesus is that he's Yahweh incarnate. In fact, if we looked at all the parallel accounts, Jesus does this miracle again, only the difference is then Jesus walks on water. And if we go to Job chapter 9, verse 5, it asks the question, who alone walks on water? And the answer is Yahweh. Yahweh alone walks on water. Jesus walks on water. And maybe we should um, uh, look at that. I don't want you to just take my word for any of it. Uh, so we'll pull up uh, Job 9. But it's just reinforcing this point that Yahweh is the one who does all this. Uh, Job answered uh, and said, uh, Truly I know, how can a man be right before God? If one wished to contend with him, one could not answer him once in a thousand times. He is wise in heart, mighty in strength, who has hardened himself against him and succeeded. He removes mountains and they know it not when he overturns them in his anger who shakes the earth out of its place and its pillars tremble, who commands the sun and it does not rise, who seals up the stars, who alone stretched out the heavens, who alone tramples down the waves of the sea. Job is saying that Yahweh does that. And then we come to the New Testament and Jesus is doing these same things because Yahweh has become a human being. Uh, God, the Son, uh, 
who possesses everything that makes the one God the one God has become a man. And as God, he's doing things on earth. Well, are these psalms hearkening back to the Exodus? Or, well, I noticed two things happened with, with wind. One brought in locusts, and one wind Dry. blew all night and dried up some big crops. Is that kind of what David's hearkening back to? And also... And and creation. I mean, God splits the abyss and dry land comes and he splits the abyss at the Red Sea and dry land. So it's a recapitulation. All these stories build on one another. And when you read it, you read it in light of the previous ones and in light of the future one. And then they inform. Uh, Jonathan, you had a... Like, I still, I wonder... Well, why do we miss it? And the guy on the cross is the one, or under the cross, is the one who gets me on Passover with a hyssop branch, holding it up to Jesus' mouth. He's bleeding from his hands, his feet, his head. Hyssop branch as the Passover lambs are being sacrificed. And he didn't put it together. And I guess that shows the hardness of all our hearts apart from God's grace. That, I mean, it, God could write it on the moon and we would come up with a way not to believe it or to rationalize it. I mean, the text says that God, the things known about God are evident to them because God has made it evident. Who is this that the wind and sea obey? He made the storm be still. And Jonathan, I'm so glad you read the first part. He raised the storm and he stilled the storm. And he raises the storms in our lives and they're gifts. They're gifts from God. They don't seem like gifts at the time, but God's using those to build character, to build faith uh, in us. So now we get the story of the Gadarene demoniac. And I want to read it. And what I want us to do is to try to describe what this man's life is like. So what we're, uh, G. Campbell Morgan said, one of the greatest things you can do uh, when you come to a Bible story is, is ask God for a sanctified imagination. That is to try to get in the story, to try to live, to, to smell it, to see it, to feel it. So I'm going to read uh, these three accounts, and then we're going to talk about uh, what you find interesting. Uh, and if you don't mind, I'll just do the literal uh, translation from the Greek. And... When he went out into the other side, into the region of the Gadarenes, there met him two demon-possessed men from the tombs, having come out. And they were exceedingly difficult, so that no one was able to pass through by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What is there between us and you, O Son of God? Have you come here to torture us before the time? But while he was, uh, there was a far off from them a herd of swine, many, and it was grazing there. And the, demon, uh, the demons were encouraging him, saying, If you throw us out, send us into the herd of swine. And he said, Go. And they went out, and they went into the swine, and behold, the whole herd rushed down the brow of the hill into the sea, and they died in the water. And the herdsmen fled 
And having gone out into the city, they announced all the things and the things about the demon-possessed man. And behold, the whole city came to meet Jesus. And seeing him, they encouraged him in order that he depart from their regions. So that's Matthew's uh, version. Mark's version, 5, 1 to 20, says this. And they went across the sea into the region of the Gerasenes. And when he went out from the boat, straightway there met him from the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling place in the tombs. And no one ever with chains was able to bind him, although many times he had been bound with shackles and uh, chains uh, had been broken and the shackles had been uh, broken to pieces and the chains were crushed. And no one was able, was strong enough, no one was strong enough to tame him. And constantly, day and night, in the tombs and on the mountains, he was crying out and he was cutting himself with stones. And he, having seen Jesus from far off, ran and worshipped him. And having cried out with a loud voice, he said, What is there to do between me and you, Jesus, O Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God, don't, you should not torture me. And Jesus kept saying to him, Unclean spirit, go out from the man. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? And he says to him, Legion is my name, because we're many. And he encouraged him much in order that he might send him out, uh, that he might not, not send him out from that region. And there was there uh, on the mountain a herd of swine, a great herd of swine uh, uh, grazing. And they encouraged him saying, send us into the swine in order that we might go into them. And he permitted them. And the unclean spirits, having gone out, went into the swine, and the herd rushed down the brow of the hill into the sea, about 2,000. And they were being strangled in the sea. And the herdsmen, the ones herding them, fled, and they announced into the city, into the uh, surrounding fields, and they came to see what had happened. And they come to Jesus and they see the demon-possessed man sitting there, having been clothed and in his right mind, that is, the one who had formerly had the legion, and they were terrified. And the ones who saw what had happened announced to it how it had come about to the demon-possessed man, and they announced to him about the swine. And the people began to encourage Jesus to leave from their districts. And when he got into the boat, the demon-possessed man, uh, when Jesus got into the boat, the demon-possessed man kept on encouraging in order that he might be with Jesus. And Jesus would not let him come. But he says to him, go into your own house, to your own, go into the house, into your own people, and announce to them however many things the Lord has done for you and how the Lord has had mercy on you. And the man went out and began to preach in Decaiopolis how many things Jesus had done for him. And all were amazed. And then Luke's version in 8.26 uh, says, and, uh, and they uh, sailed to the other side, uh, the, to the region of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. And to him, when he came on the land, there met him a man, 
a certain man from the city having demons, and for a long time he had not put on clothes, nor lived in a house, but he was living in the tombs. And having seen Jesus, having cried out, he fell at his feet with a loud voice and said, What business do you and I have together, O Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, you should not torture me. For Jesus had commanded to the unclean spirit to come out, to come out from the man. And for a long time, uh, it had uh, seized him, and he had been bound with chains and shackles, uh, being guarded, and he had burst the bonds, um, and he had been driven by the demon into the desert place, places. And Jesus asked him, What's your name? And the man said, Legion, because many demons had gone into him. And they were encouraging, the demons were, that he might not command them to go into the abyss. And there was there a herd of swine, sufficient number, uh, grazing on the mountain. And the demons were encouraging Jesus in order that Jesus would permit them to go into those pigs. And Jesus permitted them. And the demons, having gone out of the man, went into the swine, and the herd rushed down the brow of the hill into the lake and were strangled. And the herdsmen, seeing it, seeing what had happened, fled and announced into the city and into the fields. And they came out to see what, would, what had happened. And they came to Jesus and they found the man sitting there from whom the demons had gone out, clothed and in his right mind, sitting at the feet of Jesus. And they were terrified. And the ones who had seen it announced to them how the demon-possessed man had been saved. And the whole crowd asked Jesus, the whole crowd in the surrounding area of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave from them because they were being held with a great fear. And he, having gotten into the boat, left. Now the man had been asking him from whom the demons had gone out to be with him. And he did not let him saying, go into your house and relate however many things God has done for you. And the man went out throughout the whole city proclaiming how many things Jesus had done for him. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. What do you find interesting about that narrative, uh, Taylor? Um, Matthew said it's two men, and one thing he said it's one man with many disciples. What do you make of that? stories that happen at different times. Um, maybe um, Matthew, Matthew is one of the disciples, right? He, he is. is okay. so and, Mark, the and Mark and Luke aren't right. disciples. They both research. Right. Mark uh, wrote down what Peter preached and Luke talked to people and wrote down what he talked about. So Matthew was there. Mark and Luke weren't there. Or we're all going to be drawn to different aspects of the story. 
like you get all this dirt down, things that stuck out to them. I mean, and it was still God inspired, but still led by their own personalities. And yeah. Last night, uh, I uh, had the privilege of teaching a class in Atlanta at RTS, the seminary down there. And uh, two guys rode down with me, and we were coming back, and there was a wreck. And uh, we sat on I-75 for two and a half hours, like parking lot, uh, while they cleared that. If you've never parked on a interstate highway for two and a half hours, you haven't missed much in mm -hmm. life. But if I describe that wreck and said a um, eighteen wheeler uh, turned over and caught fire, if somebody else in the car said twelve cars were involved in a crash with an eighteen wheeler. Are both those accounts true? When I say there was an 18-wheeler that turned over and caught on fire, I didn't say there were no other cars. I just chose to describe the main... If someone else says, well, there were many other cars involved, it's not contradicting my account I'm choosing to emphasize one thing, they're choosing to emphasize another. Matthew was a tax gatherer, he was used to counting. <laughs> and uh, when he was there, he knew there were two people. When Peter preached it and when Luke researched it, it may have been one of those two were more significant than the other. And so they give uh, the detail that was important to them, but they're not saying these are all the details. A little bit like the angels at the tomb, where on, on one account there's an angel at the tomb that said this, on another the account there's two, two angels. angels. In, in this story and that one, I think, I think, I think it's kind of similar that. They're not saying there were merely, there was merely one angel. They're saying this is what they're pointing out the significance of what happened with this. This angel. is what was important to me. And in this story, it looks like two demon possessed men came up, and kind of like with the parable of the one man that came back thankful and the nine yeah. that went away healed. It's like one man actually got changed from it and went and reported. Yeah, this other man kind of had nothing to do with Jesus. Maybe he came from that. maybe he was delivered and his heart was unchanged. What else do you find interesting? Tell me your name again. Emily. Emily. Um, I, um, I've heard this story a lot. My dad talks about it often. And one thing he always pointed out to me and one thing that stood out to me again when I was reading it and all through the account, um, the demon recognized Jesus. They called him um, son of man or son of the most high God. Right. Like instantly. And... They beg not to, be not, not to be tortured. Did you pick that up in the account? And they beg not to be sent to the abyss. They're assuming what about Jesus? That he has the right to send them to the abyss. They, they choose to hate God and God wants them to repent and they won't. But they're terrified. They're terrified of the abyss. And it blows my mind that that watery thing at the second day of creation when God splits it and makes dry land appear that's called the abyss the bottomless place, uh, the bottomless pit. It's uh, translated in Revelation. What else do you find interesting? I kind of find it comforting in the fact that like, they were 
they need him not to be threatened with it because I think that there's so much um, thing that happens on this world and some of it is from demonic like oppression and stuff like that. And it's comforting to know that like, there's a place that even in this time they can be sent away. Like God still has total authority to be like, you need to knock it off. And, then, and the day's going to come when God settles accounts. God is crying his eyes out, hoping that people will repent. But the day's mm -hmm. going to come when he pays back everyone according. Uh, when all the uh, uh, Adolf Eichmanns and Auschwitz, all the Adolf Hitlers, all the Stalins, all the Pol Pots, uh, that God has a reckoning. What else do you find interesting? Describe this man's life. Or Emily, were you going to make a comment? Um, yeah, I was going to make comments about that. Um, I don't know. This is probably just in light of uh, reading some of this man's wrestling um, this week in classes, of our class in this class. But I just, I couldn't get out of my head that if yes, this man is demon possessed. this man's life and life before being saved by them. Like, I just couldn't get that out of my mind. Because he's just, like, so overcome and utter, just completely, utterly helpless and unable to break free from this. And that's exactly where... It's what I, I deserve. Yeah. yeah. This guy... I mean, you, you ask this, yourself the question, why this guy? He was a pagan. When they go across the lake, they're going from the Jewish area to the non-Jewish area. The pigs, uh, non-Jewish people raise pigs. Often they use pigs in worshiping demons. Uh, this man's a pagan. Uh, perhaps he's Canaanite or something. Uh, and that rejection of God's rule in favor of self-rule resulted in his demon possession. And at the end of the day, I had rejected God too. Uh, and I deserve, if God just give, gave me what I asked for, I would be in the domain of darkness. Jonathan, you were going to make a comment? Well, like on the homework, one of the questions that really stumped me, and I wrote a little bit on it, but not, not an actual answer. Um, why did Jesus allow, why did Jesus permit, or even instruct this man to, to go to hell, to go ship? Um, is it because it was a non-Jewish area? It could be that uh, he didn't want the Gentile mission to start until he had been raised from the dead. But I want you to think about something with me. So in terms of this guy's life, what do we know from the details that we read that this guy's life was like? And I found a, a picture. I'll turn the lights out and it'll sharpen that up. Um, describe this guy's life for me based on the details in the story. He, he lived in the tombs. Now, um, in Jewish culture, there's something that we've got to learn about living in tombs that's not uh, obvious to us. Um, if you ever get a chance to go to Israel, there's a place that they'll take you. Uh, it seems like it was near the American Institute of Oriental Studies I remember in 1993 going there and there's a cave and you crawl in it on your hands and knees. It's uh, about three feet high and you go into this room, many rooms in a cave and there are all these beds in there. And what you would do if you had a relative that died is you would put their dead body in that cave and you put a rock over the front of it 
so that animals couldn't get in. And you would leave that person's body in that cave for a year. At the end of the year, you would take the stone off and you would go in and the, all the soft material had rotted away. And you would collect the bones, put the bones in a, a jar called an ossuary, and you would bury the ossuary. So what this man was living in was one of those caves. And I remember crawling in that cave and you crawl back in those rooms and you can't see your hand in front of your face. I think we did it at noon and you crawl in there and it is pitch black, dark. This man was living in there. Help me. What was that like? Total darkness? What, what did that place smell like? Was Did this man have clothes on? No. Uh, what was he doing day and night? It's a, the marking account says he was doing day and night. What was he doing? He was cutting himself. Um... It says there were legion. How many people are in a Roman legion? It's 6,000. There are 60 centuries in a Roman uh, legion. Um, now, the, the demons could be lying. We know there were 2,000 pigs, so that maybe there were only 2,000. But if it were a full legion, it was 6,000. Were these demons allowing this man to go to sleep? Mark says day and night. He was cutting himself with stones. Where was he cutting himself? His entire body. What does his body look like? Bloody and scarred and bruised. Sores and pus. He was, and what were these 6,000 or 2,000 or whatever demons doing day and night to this man? They were torturing him. Did you pick up in the story they were giving the man supernatural strength? He would have to move it. Uh, he's given supernatural strength because he can break fetters and chains. We know that he was malicious to other people because it says no one could pass the way. What do you think about 6,000 entities who would get their jollies by torturing one person? That's sick. That's like serial killer sick. Only the difference is they're giving the man the inability to die. And they're torturing him and torturing him. And Jesus comes and there's a question, why doesn't he just send him to the abyss? He had the power to do it. They know he had the power to do it. But instead, Jesus sent them into the pigs. And it says that all the pigs rushed down, and then it says they were strangled. They were strangled. Uh, so they go in the water. I, I was taught that pigs can't swim, and then a uh, person here at Brian who raised pigs said pigs can swim. I stand corrected. But these pigs were, were drowning. And do you know when you drown, you vomit often? Uh, it's, uh, your body will react and 
So picture all these pigs drowning and squealing and vomiting and sucking in water and gagging and squealing and dying. Why did Jesus let me see that as a disciple? Right, they get sent to the abyss. Nobody knows whether there were that many demons in them. Yeah. It's kind of a... Yeah, it, we we know that there are a lot of them by the pigs dying. I don't know, but in a way, it kind of shows grace to them by not making them go to the abyss at that time. He, he's giving the demons every opportunity to repent. He's also showing us how wicked the demons are. How wicked do you have to be to torture an animal? These are sick entities. And God wants us to know that when we reject the rule of God, what we're asking for is someone else's rule. How about the kindness of <clears throat> sending them into swine instead of letting them work out with other people? Right. We don't know if Jesus did send them to the abyss after they went into the swine, but it could be exactly that. Um, now let me ask you a question. We're not told in the story, but when Jesus freed this man, why was this man so attached to Jesus? He got it. He got it that Jesus was the one free. Love much. That's what I was thinking of with this man. Like he, like he was a, has like like utterly just completely under the rule of darkness right now. He's not. Yeah. It's interesting to me if you ask the question when Jesus healed this man. Do you think this man had scars? I mean, when those demons were making this man cut himself, was that a nice cutting or was it a horrific cutting? It was horrific. If Jesus healed the man, perhaps Jesus healed the man's scars. But suppose he didn't heal the man's scars. What would it be like for that guy to go into a city? The text says he went into the 10 city region, Decaiopolis. He walks into a park and sits down on the bench. What did he look like? Isn't some little kid going to come up and say, what? What happened to you? And what's the man going to say? <clears throat> I used to live with dead people. I was tortured day and night by 6,000 demons. And this man came and freed me. <clears throat> I wonder if God doesn't leave our scars sometimes to give us 
a platform to share. Did you pick up This is the actual place where that happened. These are the actual caves where the men lived. That's the brow of the hill down which they rushed into the uh, sea. What's interesting is... Dikaiopolis is a ten-city region. Jesus called, told him to go to his house and tell the good news. And the man went to the ten-city region and told everybody. And did you pick up in the story, Jesus tells him, uh, Mark says, go tell what the Lord it's done, you don't know if it's the Lord in heaven or the Lord Jesus. Luke helps us with that by spelling it out. In Luke it says, go tell how much God has done for you. And what does the man tell? He tells what Jesus had done for him. And do you see how that whole idea of who is this the wind and sea obey him who is this who set me free the man got it the man got why the demons were begging Jesus not to send them to the abyss because the man realized that Jesus is God and that Jesus had set him free I think Emily's point is exactly right. Have not every single one of us rejected the rule of God? Haven't we said God's got this kingdom, but I don't really want God to rule and reign. I want to rule and reign over myself. And we assume that we can just be neutral, you know, and just rule ourselves, but it's like if we reject the rule of God, there's somebody else who's going to come in. And with this man, we see if God takes away his hedge of protection, that's what you get. You get a place of wicked, evil people. And Jesus has the power to set all of us free. Jesus has the power to send the lead. And do you get the irony? 6,000 demons, one Jesus. And when Je and it says no one was strong enough to tame him. And Jesus sets foot. And they come and beg Jesus. And Jesus has the power because Jesus is God incarnate. Well, I pray that God will use that narrative to bless all of our lives today. I hope you have a great weekend, and I'll see you on Monday.